Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining me in Music TT's session today as part of their Steel Pan Week, which commemorates, of course, Global Entrepreneurship Week. I want to thank Music TT for having me and, of course, the business of Carnival Brand in this event, because I think it's very important for us to focus on the steel pan as our national instrument, um, especially as we are looking at the whole question of a virtual carnival for 2021. So in this session, I wanted to do things a little bit differently. I know that many of you would have been taking part in these sessions all week where persons would have been teaching via PowerPoint presentations and so on. So for this one, I wanted to mix things up a little bit. And instead of showing a PowerPoint, I wanted to show you all an episode from season three of the Business of Carnival earlier this year where the guests Nyla Blackman and Anson, her manager, Anson Sobral, her manager and producer, we discussed a lot about the steel pan business. So the intention is for you all to watch that episode, that's about 20 minutes, and then jump straight into the questions. So it's a chat format, you all can drop your questions in the chat box and I'll answer as many of them as are possible. So to just give you some kind of insight into the format, I want you all to look at the episode with a couple of topics in mind. So apart from the part of the episode where Nyla shares her very frank views on steel pan and music and dance hall and so on, there are a couple of other music industry matters that we discuss. So we talk about really dicey topics like the interplay between steel pan dance hall and soca and where do these genres actually fit into carnival and should there be more collaboration between these genres uh while we are kind of reimagining what a carnival can look at and even should there be space for other genres outside of the typical um soca um calypso and so on then we look at the question also in the episode of mentorship in the music industry, not just in Trinidad and Tobago, but really across the Caribbean, because a lot of you are based in different parts of the region. And I want to get you to start thinking about the whole question of carnival is not going to happen in the same way that it usually does next year, right? So should the established artist established music producers and so forth should they be using this time for more mentorship with the up-and-coming producers up-and-coming artists and and, re and with respect to steel pan as well this is the topic that we're here to discuss right should there be more mentorship in steel pan what's what's happening there i also want you all to look at the question of local content because that's something we discuss towards the end of the episode should there be local content quotas in our music industry for steel pan, for Calypso, Soka, and so forth? This is something that has been discussed for years. The whole question of mandating that a specific amount of our local music be played on the airwaves. All of you all know that live performances have not been possible really since March. So performance incomes are down. Perhaps local content quotas mandating that radio stations, television stations, and so forth play a certain amount of our music, maybe a way to assist in generating more revenue. And then also, I want you all to focus on the whole question of influencer agreements. Where does that fit in now? You know, and what kind of questions do you all have about those? I've been seeing a sharp increase in the number of influencer agreements. Um, at least in Trinidad and Tobago, with corporate companies reaching out to people in the industry with large followings and getting them basically to be brand ambassadors and so forth. Should that type of thing also happen in the steel pan? And what's happening in your neck of the woods and in the island that you're logging on from? So at this point, I'm going to play the episode, take your notes, and I will join you all towards the end of the clip. Make we tweet again. 
Hi everyone, I'm Carla Paris, entertainment and sports lawyer. Welcome to the Business of Carnival Season 3, Trinidad and Tobago Edition. I'm here at the beautiful Think Artwork TT Studios. Join us as this series is designed to educate you about the legal and business aspects of the carnival industry so that we can minimize exploitation and generate revenue. Welcome to part two of our joint interview with Nyla Blackman and Anson Sovrol. Nyla Blackman is taking the world by storm. She's the granddaughter of the late Ras Shorty I and the daughter of Abby Blackman. Nyla shot into fame in 2017 with mega hits, including Workout with Kess. Since then, she's gone on to cop several awards and even nominated for Best New International Act by BET in 2018. Anson is not only Nyla's manager, he's also a prolific producer in his own right, producing top tracks for talents like Marshall, Shansia, Vibes Cartel, and many more. Nyla, to many of us, it seems as though you almost sort of intuitively have your finger on the pulse of the nation. You have this new track called More Soka, yes. right? But while you have this track, which is heating up the airwaves, there's a, another hot debate on right now about the amount of soca being played versus dance hall in carnival. It's all over the airwaves. People are calling in and saying that there should be more dance hall in the fets and that it's not a big deal, that we need to be open. We can't be protectionist of our culture. Where do you stand on this? I think that, you know, this sort of training that Trinidad and Tobago has the mentality that we have, it's not going to change overnight. I think it really needs to change from the young people. I think it needs to change overall and uh, with our leaders and uh, being taught to the infants about as you say protecting the culture i feel like a lot of us i me personally i was only taught because i come from a very culturally involved family but not a lot of you two are blessed like me to have that. And just from being amongst the rest of them, it's like we weren't really taught our culture by anyone else. Like, you know what I mean? We weren't really taught it much in school. We were inundated um, with American TV, American music. And yeah. Jamaican music. Jamaican. Jama it, it, we were just, we were drenched with that. Like, that was what was cool. cool. That was what was this. And it, it's, it's from like every generation comes down so it's like now we we have to fight for something and i think that um it, it stems deeper than just soca dance hall um it stems beyond that you know everybody knows we have a bandwagoners culture and we do not promote our own artists we do not promote our own we do not respect them and carry them on we have so many living legends and you're only going to hear about how much they were great and how much they did when they're dead and then like one year later, no one cares, you know what I mean? So going back to your real question, which is, um, you know, what, how do I feel about it? I, I would say that, you know, obviously we need more soca. And I think which has a part to play is that dancehall, the Trinidad dancehall that is emerging and the young artists, I support the fact that, you know, they're doing something, they're expressing themselves um, and they're finding their own little niche because some people would feel a little bit locked out of soca, like, oh, I can't, I can't join soca because I, I, don't, I don't know anybody or I don't have a link or my music isn't going to get played on the radio or like, you know, there's so much politics involved in soca, a young person might just feel like, you know what, I think I'll stay away from soca because I don't know if I could actually make it. And it's a real fact. Soca isn't just given to the youths. We have to fight for it. And then <laughs> dance all. Also, we go back to more cre on the creative side. And this is why it's drawn. And this is why the people want to hear it more in the parties and mm -hmm. in the carnival. It's because 
we limit soca. We limit soca to just be a wine and a jam and a this or that. Of course, it has that in dancehall, but there's a lot of other things, a lot of real content that people are experiencing every single day, being a ghetto youth, being some, but like just being everything. Of course, soca has a lot of broad topics as well, but I feel like the youth may not, may not be drawn to it because it's not being brought across in the way they know it and live their life and I think it's up for more youths to be bringing those messages across and I would say big up to Trinidad Ghost by doing something like I with INC like mm. uh, like that song like you know so many different things like that you know where he is one of them that could actually do dance all and soca mm. and like make it right now we have an identity crisis and we always want to be someone else and we need to be so proud of who we are that it's undeniable I want to be me, I want to be a Trinbegonian. You know what I mean? That's what. That's where it needs to start because Soka is Trinidad and Tobago, Calypso is Trinidad and Tobago, Silpan is Trinidad and Tobago, and we need to make everybody say, "I want to be Trinidadian, Trinbegonian." That's what. That's where it needs to start because right now we're saying, "I want to be American. I want to be Jamaican. I want to be from Lucia. I want to be from you know the identity crisis." You were talking about. One of the issues is that they're not, soca is not as accessible, right? Which is why some people are training to dance all. And in fact, that was a big topic on one of the radio stations yesterday. So people were calling in and saying that the reason why dance hall is infiltrating the Fed is because more people feel as though they're welcome in dance hall. They sing dance hall and the topics in dance hall, like you said, are kind of mirroring what's happening in their personal lives. But how do you make it more accessible then? I would say it starts by help, right? There's many different ways. Um, the radio stations could do their this, part. This is help. What are we doing now? That's right. Right. <laughs> right. So the radio stations could do their part. The artist that's been in this business for 10, 20 years could do their part. How about taking one, two, or three artists that you see that, be that, you believe, that they believe in and say, you know what, this artist could do some damage. This artist could change the scope of this. Take a, take a young artist and teach them what they know. I think it's about having a team. Every artist needs a team from beginning to end, um, from the initial stages to the ending stages um, where you know they're actually established. They need people to support them. If it's not your family, if it's not, you know, um, your friends, somebody in the industry that you could find a mentor. I think more people in the industry that is soca um, need to lend a helping hand to the youth. And uh, I think it will start by example. Mm -hmm. And that's why we, Anson and I, our mission is to really take soca international because I think that that will be an, an example that people would say, oh, I want to follow in. I want to do this too. It can be done because as of right now, it's never really been done before. And um, so in, in the minds, I mean, a lot of Jamaican artists have made it, have done it and have reached big worldwide and keep on going. So the youth are going to watch that and say, but I mean, we don't see it for ourselves. Yeah, so yeah. I, I want to do. I want to do this more. I want to. I want to do dance all because dance all reaches further. Right. I want to reach far. You know that. Yeah. Way. Carnival started becoming so commercialized and taken from the ground and becoming a more uptown, midtown kind of scene. Mm -hmm. and you know that they started feeling left out and when you take when you take away something from somebody and you and they're feeling left out what they're gonna create their own and as Nyla said they're gonna not only create their own but they're gonna create what they see and hear and feel and live every day they're not gonna do their own version of soccer they're gonna sing about what they want what they live in every single day and that's what you're seeing happening this is that revolution like oh and now you're telling me we don't need the industry, we don't need radio play, we don't need the same promoters, they're gonna just do it on their own. And then we're in the age of social media where you, you can put a song out, and I've seen it with these, with this dance song, 
they put out a song and within a matter of days is 300,000 views to a million in a week or two, which is numbers that a lot of soca artists don't see. So this is just fueling them, it's empowering them to feel like, yo, we don't even need to be a part of this. And yo, we don't even respect the sanctity of this two-man window because why do we have to? You didn't include us before, you never was bothered by us before. We've been doing this all years. You just now notice it because it's big and people want to hear it. Dance is still, it's still much bigger than Soka yes. internationally, but it's definitely plateaued a bit. Dance has plateaued and, and now we don't know where that plateau is going to turn. We don't know if it's going to decline or if we're going to get a resurgence. Who knows? Cartel might be released in the morning and this conversation will be All over. irrelevant. <laughs> But I could say Soka for sure hasn't peaked, so it's on the rise. You know, I am happy. I'm glad that right. now promoters now have options and they don't have to pay the 20, 30,000 US to bring a dance or like. They could look in their own backyard and I support that. Mm -hmm. During Carnival, maybe not so much, but I don't think that's going to be an issue when those foreigners come in. Mm -hmm. Because um, what we see traveling all around the world is that soca parties are on a, are on a rise and dance hall parties Definitely. are on a low. Um, you know, soca is going to blow up. It's blowing up. We're in the process of that. And now we need the home to back it fully and wholly. And that's how we will own and take advantage of what is ours. Because Soon enough, it could actually slip away from us if we let it. So since you're saying that soccer is peaking and it's on the rise, should this not be an opportunity in terms of the business structures within soccer and just sort of to promote ourselves? Should we be, or should artists, you know, our songwriters be more strategic in terms of looking at creating songs for Pan? Because we all know what's happened with our Pan. We created it. You know, now we know Nyla would have created songs for Pan, you know, with her soca that Phase 2 had intended to play. Mm -hmm. You know, you've had songs I and Love and that kind of thing with Love until the Rhythm Section. Do you think that there should be a little bit more of a structured approach, given that you're saying that soca is more on the rise and whatnot? We can now find a way to have the business of Pan too elevated or you know, is it that it should just be more, leave it in the organic way that it's well, always been? I think the pan fraternity is its own entity. And like, for us, for us who are more, I guess, in the soca world to, to speak on it, like they, like, pan people are very passionate. So you gotta be careful of what you say and how you say it. I don't think we go out there with the intention to make a pan song, but, but, but that's it what grab, I'm asking. But Should it, there it, be more intention? Is I, what I'm asking. Well, the reason, to help raise their profile think, because collectively we're one culture. I just know, I know. Hmm? I see you. <laughs> what I would say is, for me, my intention is usually to make good music. Mm -hmm. Right? That's my personal. Life. I just want to make good music. Yes. And. I think pan shouldn't be limited to just a pan song. I don't even know what a pan song is. I know what songs work better on pan. You know, if you could whistle a melody and, and understand what song that is, usually that's, to me, a better, it makes for a better pan song. Pan has different energy levels if you're trying to move a crowd. So I think we should focus on making good music first. That could not only be just for pan, but for a global, reach mm -hmm. and pan should be able to play a justin bieber pan should be able to draw for uh Nicki minaj you know what i mean i don't i don't want to limit pan to just soca artists doing a pan song Nyla, how are you? what i would say about it is that because i understand what you're trying to say by asking the question as um should we be strategic about making more pan songs no i don't think you should reason being is because I think that, um, you know, sometimes when you're not fully organic, it just comes out forced and it doesn't work. What I think that should come from soca and soca artists to support pan is to have more pan appreciation. Mm -hmm. When you have more pan appreciation and pan love, 
and I am love, <laughs> you spread, you spread, you spread the pan fever. Because if it is that you do a song and you put a steel pan in it, that is pan appreciation. If it is you do a song and you um, mention a, a steel pan remotely, like like a passing comment that is pan appreciation if it is that you know there's like a driving base in the back that is somewhat of a pan that is pan appreciation there's so many different ways that you could have pan appreciation and iron love even if it is that you just have like an iron in your song that's also appreciation i think that we should promote if it is just having if a pan is to a cover of your song that's right. regular that's what I'm it up. it's about. a pan it's pan appreciation right pan appreciation soca artists have a the limelight the this the these the, the spotlights shining on them for us to highlight our instrument and how amazing it is is our job that's that's precise so my point that's what you the we nail on the head yeah to promote pan yeah. I think it comes back to the point of a national identity and exactly. maintaining and kind of exactly. understanding where we came from. So I, I do think that artists need to be a little bit more conscious, you know, definitely. as it happens globally in other cultures. Yeah, definitely. You know? And it goes, it goes even with wearing local designers uh, other than choosing to, you know, um, go online, go online, and buy something that's or like cheaper. even to like a, a an other, you know, one of those popular brands or whatever from outside. Okay, it's great. Everybody knows you have money. I, I completely agree. And I've been part of several uh, policies called draft policies on a piece of legislation called local content legislation. I don't know if you all are familiar with mm -hmm. it at all. What it means is that uh, they are going to legislate the amount of local content that has to be played on local radio stations, local film and so forth. Now, these policies have been coming for the past decade and it always reaches a draft stage and then it's never passed because the feeling always is any pushback from the radio stations and the broadcasters are, well, why should I be told how much I am going to play? I pay for the station. This is a private entity that I run. Why should governments tell me? But the thought process behind local content legislation is that if you all are not playing your indigenous music naturally, then we have to find a way to incentivize it. So you put it in the legislation and you get tax breaks. That's a, that's a great initiative um, that the government is doing, but there's also other things that the government can do right. to help. and The business of music. The business of music. And one thing is that me as an artist, I understand that with everything that we do, we need money. We always need money. Every, every artist, no artist can go far without money. It's just impossible. You can't go far without money. Oh, I don't know if you have contacts who could just, you know what I mean, contacts that are willing to do things for you for free, but that's not how it works. Like, everything happens with money. I mean, the allocations, the budget allocations, yeah. the creative you know sector. I mean? Yes. Yeah. I mean, that, that is just like, I mean, you could, now basically you're putting the responsibility in other people's hands other than your own when you could play a bigger role and by that, by that big role that you're playing can then now inspire. You see, this is why it needs to, the, the, the head needs to inspire the bottom. Right. So now the radio station's owner is going to be like, wow, you know, the government is really pushing behind this. And, you know, I might make less money if I don't play what the people, quote unquote, want. And, I, you know, I might get less um I might make less money, but I see what they're trying to do, and mm -hmm. I want to I wanna put my strength behind this, because right. I'm inspired. But if you are not doing anything, and then you want somebody else to give up what, what they're doing, it's like, no, you're not leading by example. You're just wanting, you're telling people what to do, and you're not doing it yourself. I endorse that. I'm happy to hear you say that. I know that's what you stand for in any event. That's what you've come from. You can't escape it. <laughs> So, guys, as I end off the interview, I really would appreciate if you take a look back at your younger selves. I'm going to start with you, Anson. Mm -hmm. If you I was could, just there this. That we well. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. You know. Lies. <laughs> I'm joking. Yeah. If you let's say go back a decade, right, with everything that you've experienced. 
What advice would you give to yourself in terms of approaching the business of the music industry so that your journey to today would have been a lot smoother? Um, funny enough, a lot of my stuff, if I check back, it, it was ahead of its time. So I, I don't really feel like... I think I was on the right trajectory, the right path. Because, I mean, unknown to a lot of people, I could have broken out a long time ago, you know, um, when I was in primary school. Not much people know this, but I had a song that charted in a lot of the Asian territories. It was oh, wow. In okay. Sri Lanka. I mean, I had songs I was in Ultra, Coachella. But I had songs charting, and, and I had opportunities to fly out to Asia when I was in Form 1, you know. And I just felt like I am not ready for this, you know. And I just waited and developed myself a little more until I reached to the point where I know the knowledge that I know today. So to my younger self, I'd probably give me more man money management tips rather than music. I did a lot of bad business with money. So I would tell them I definitely I'd have a better money management system, save, make better investments. That would have put me in a much better place today. Nilo. What advice would you give to your younger self in terms of the business of music, making your transition smoother? I would tell my younger self, not every opportunity that seems good is the right opportunity. For Powerful. Me. Yes. I know everything like this is gold. Same thing, but yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. That's definitely a fascinating way to end the interview. I want to thank you both for taking the time. This has been really, really, um, you know, just powerful is the word that I could think of. You know, I'm really proud to see what you all have done together as a team. I mean, I've known Anson for a while and I've met you in the past. It's great to see your growth and I wish you all the best for the season and beyond. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Come from love, show so long, and it's all again. This has been a fascinating episode with Nyla and Anson, and we look forward to continuing the conversation in the comments below. Don't forget to hop on to thebusinessofcarnival.com where you'll receive exclusive updates of our upcoming events. Okay, so we've just seen one of the episodes of season three where Nyla and Anson talked about a variety of topics um, specific to the music industry but as you would have seen close to the 12 minute point we spoke a lot about punk and whether artists or artists producers and so forth should strategically be creating pan songs and we saw Nyla's view we saw Anson's view and now that we know that we're approaching a really unknown space as we enter into Virtual Carnival 2021, uh, what do you all think? Let me know in the questions below what your views are. I know that we have Grenada in the house. We have Antigua in the house. We have, of course, Trinidad and Tobago in the house. So let me check now the chat box to see what y'all are saying. Oh yes, okay. I see Nevin Roach from Barbados is there. I see Caroline from Jamaica. I see Mahalia Thomas. Let me know your thoughts, y'all. Like, what do y'all think about PAN? And what do y'all think about the whole question of PAN integrating into virtual carnival? Do y'all think it's possible? Okay, yes. So I see some questions that have come in in the private chat mode where persons are saying that they're not certain whether the pan can be incorporated into a virtual model. You know, 
some people think that pan should purely be a physical event and they're not certain how it can take place. But I can tell you all that earlier in this year, we had events. We had events, um, one of them is specifically called a panorama. And we have the producer for that event is chat right now. That took place in, I think it was in around April this year where various pan bands from different parts of the world took part in this live event. And he was able to get sponsorship from various pan bodies in Trinidad and Tobago. And people were able to get um, what is called sponsorship monies and so forth for playing in these various events. So the whole question of whether a uh, pan can be physical and transcend to virtual, it is, it is very possible, yes. I'm not seeing. Okay, I see someone is saying, Kai is saying, Pan should not be a carnival thing, but an all round industry that thrives throughout the year. Yes, exactly. It definitely should be an all round event. Um, and then the question is I want to ask you all, how do you think it should be an all round event that thrives throughout the year? We know that Pan often. Um, is heavily subsidized by government grants. And it's often also subsidized by private sector um, companies. But the question is now that there would not be a physical panorama, or let's say there may not be a physical panorama because we don't know, you know what, what may happen in the, in the coming months, how, how is it going to take place? You know, how can... Kai, maybe you could let us know in the comments. Like, how do you think Pan can be incorporated all year round? Oh, let me see. Okay, so I see Nevin Roach has said it definitely is possible. And I believe that Pan and Vegas has been, dis been discussing different ideas and what can be presented. Whatever the final product turns out to be definitely would not be the same, but it is possible. Yes, it definitely is possible. And that's the thing. I think people in the pan industry need to be really, think very innovatively right now of in these online events. You know, because that's what a lot, that's a lot of the feedback that I'm getting now from persons in the corporate sector, you know. Oh, I'm seeing Andrew saying, Pan is something that you feel. I'm not sure if it will translate into a digital format only. It would have to be something hybrid. That's very interesting. I mean, we have had a purely virtual pan event earlier this year, Andrew, through Nevin Roach's Panorama, which I would encourage you all to check out on Instagram. Um, but in terms of the hybrid model, I know that's something that a lot of um, pan players have been saying to me. They're concerned about, like, how would it translate? Um, if it's hybrid, then because of the large number of persons involved in a steel orchestra, the whole question of social distancing and putting everybody together in this pan yard, how would that work? You know, how, how would that, how would that, the, the, the sound and the so forth properly translate? But I want to ask you all also in terms of the question of mentorship in the music industry at this stage. Do you all think that it's something that should be, um, should take place more heavily now, now that there is a downtime, if, if you want to call it that, and it is a new whole question of live performances and people aren't rushing from carnival to carnival all over the world, should establish artists and should establish pan orchestras be using this time to reach out to the up and coming persons um, in the music industry? Do you all think that's relevant or that it's not, it's not important at this point and people should just be kind of figuring out their space individually? I'm reading the comments. Okay, I see that Nevin Roach has said during the COVID-19 lockdowns, there was also Pan Pan Ramage from Exodus. Okay, that was a virtual event. 
beat the pandemic virtual concert series from Renegade Steel Orchestra and Pan Motion concert series, among many other virtual events. So the point is that the whole question of uh, virtual presence is in fact possible because he's saying that there were all of these various um, events, be it the pandemic virtual concert series from Renegades, Pan Motion concert series, Pan Ramachay from Exodus. Um, Nevin, can you tell us if all of these were on Instagram or was it all was it also on Facebook? Because I think some of the challenge, at least what I've been told from Pan players, is that because a lot of these events are taking place on Instagram and some of them don't have Instagram accounts, that it might be a little challenging to follow, you know? So I don't know if that's something that um, Pan bands might also want to consider the whole question of uh, involved in Instagram and Facebook. Because I know sometimes when I've reached out to Steel Pan bands across the islands, the Caribbean islands, there is no social media presence at all. Or some of it is just limited to Facebook. When really we know that Instagram um, certainly is the sort of more of a leading platform for, for integration and to, to get sort of a larger following. So I want to ask you all now about the question of the influencer agreements. I Some people have been messaging me, by the way, in the private chat and saying that um, their feed or so forth is stuck. So I'll just talk you a little bit through um, this aspect of it in that, uh, oh, okay, I see Calvin is saying, I'm now seeing some of the chats coming through. It was a little difficult to read before. Calvin from Grenada is saying pan managers and pan organizers should use this time to reinvent the concept of what presence they want to present to the world. That's very true. This is Calvin from Spice Mass Grenada. They have to start having virtual events to begin testing the virtual market space and to get feedback as to how to better the production for the virtual market that we have to be forced into. That's a good, good contribution, Calvin, because yeah, it's only through trial and error that you will know whether the virtual space is a good fit to, for something like Pan, where obviously production, you know, size of the band and that type of thing is definitely important and definitely of the essence. So, Calvin, what you what might want to do is go on the Instagram pages of some of the, these events that Nevin Roach was speaking about. He said that there was Pan Ramage from Exodus. There was Beat the Pandemic virtual concert series from Renegade Steel Orchestra. And there was a Pan Motion concert series, among other virtual events. So, let's see what Kai is saying. Kai is saying... By promoting Pan throughout the year, not just around Carnival, and also making people aware that soca is not the only thing that can be played on Pan. It is an instrument that can play any genre and is just as important as the other instruments. Also getting more young people to appreciate Pan and to develop a passion for it through workshops like this. That's a very good point, Kai. I mean, we do need to develop and appreciate Pan that's why Nyla, if you noticed in her, in the interview that we just played, she was talking a lot about pan appreciation, you know, and that's something that needs to be inculcated from a very young age because a lot of us didn't really grow up with a strong sense of, you know, oh my gosh, you know, I have to hear this new pan song that's coming out every panorama. I mean, for me, my parents took me to the pan yards every year. You know, we, I was very much aware of panorama. I would follow all of the various um, bands and so forth. My mother is a huge Trinidad All-Stars fan. So I was very you know, aware and integrated into Carnival at a young age, but I know that's not um, everybody's experience. And we really have been sort of indoctrinated by you know, dance hall. And of course, a lot of American music um, is definitely the case. Uh, I want to ask you all also of all of these brand partnerships that we're seeing taking place in the industry. Um, 
and specifically to music, because I'm not going to call the names of brands, but I'm sure you all are aware. There are a lot of um, alcohol brands, beverage brands, and so forth that are now entering into these arrangements with people in the music industry, whether it be DJs, soca artists, and so forth, to promote their particular brands. Do you all think that this is possible in steel pan? Because we actually do have a number of breakout steel pan players um, who have been exposing pan to a younger market. Many of you all would know of Johan Chakri. He is fantastic. And he doesn't just play soca on pan. He plays a lot of genres of music, pop music on the pan. Do you all think that the corporate entities should be entering into these arrangements with steel pan players? And would you and your organization be interested in, in that type of thing? I'm not seeing the, I'm not seeing more questions coming in or I'm not seeing a direct response to that question. So I'll let you all know that what I think, I think that PAN definitely should be integrated more in the mainstream for sure. And that in order for people to realize that PAN is not just um, important in carnival time that many of our, some of our younger sort of standout pan players definitely could be integrated into brand campaigns, um, into strategic marketing opportunities and so forth. So that pan is not just simply limited, you know, as we're all saying to carnival and so forth. And we can use this time in all of our islands, whether you're watching this from Trinidad and Tobago, from Barbados, from Grenada, from Jamaica, we can use this time to reinvent the concept of how steel pan integrates into culture in general. You know, um, I also think that this time should be used by steel pan players and by musicians in general to sort of structure their corporate operations. We know that a lot of uh, carnival bands, for example, are not always corporate entities with legal personalities. We know that a lot of the committee members who are, and I'm not going to call the names, we all know the names of the well-known carnival bands. A lot of the times these committees are not properly structured. So we're not sure of a lot of various, you know, things like who owns the name of the carnival band or what percentage interest do you have? as a committee member, or how exactly am I supposed to be compensated beyond getting a free ticket? This is the time I think that a lot of that um, sort of structural work should be done, you know, um, to really make sure that when we head into 2022, we're not starting from ground zero again. Calvin is saying that the pan must first have an appeal to attract the corporate entity. That is very true. That is very true, Calvin, in that, because that's what a lot of the corporate entities are saying, that's plausible. So it's more about how can we invest in something that generates a return for us, that's interesting for us, that converts into sales for us of our product. So yes, it must have an appeal. Um, Calvin, you're saying that that, making sure that the pan has an appeal will give the assurance that the pan can sell the brand and give the company value for money. Yes, exactly. That's exactly it. Nevin is saying, Nevin Roach is saying, Joshua Regrello has had a very good relationship with Digicel. Oh, that's interesting. Thanks for that, um, Nevin. And most recently, he got hooked up with Samsung Caribbean. I'm sure that there are others as well, but it's always a good look for businesses to get involved. When Joshua Regrello, and I, I believe Joshua Regrello also has an Instagram page. So many of you all on the chat, you all might want to go and check his page out to see, you know, what is his relationship with the corporate industry? That's, this is a really good point. When Joshua and other guys like Keyshawn, Julian, Chazzy from St. Lucia, and others with huge followings bring great exposure to any company that's interested in working with them. 
So this is good. So this shows that there, there actually has been an interplay between the steel pan industry um, and the corporate entity with the whole influencer brand partnership type of uh, deal, which we are seeing is more and more prominent now in the entertainment industry than ever before. I'm actually going to check out that deal um, that Joshua Regalo has with Digicel and so forth. That's, that's very interesting. I mean, you all would have seen, or you may have seen that earlier this year, Notting Hill Carnival in particular, um, they had a very interesting deal with Samsung in the UK, where as part of their relationship, there was a digital billboard. And I think it was Piccadilly Circus in the UK, you know, where the whole question of Notting Hill Carnival was promoted and so forth. And a lot of carnival organizations are still referring to that Notting Hill Carnival virtual um, model as some sort of blueprint, you know? So I think the resounding feedback in the chat is that we really do need to see more of that relationship between, um, you know, the corporate entities, the steel pan players, the steel pan band, to sort of buttress that whole relationship and experience of having pan played year round. And people not just thinking that pan is a carnival thing, and it's a rushed something and you know you just you go to your your um pan yards you know a couple of months before panorama or weeks before panorama and then you just forget about pan all together uh the other the last topic because i see it's just we just have about 10 minutes left that i want to talk about is the whole question of the relationship between pan and other genres of music, or even other genres of music in general. Have you all been seeing and wherever you're looking on from more of a collaborative relationship between let's say Pan and Soka, or pop and Soka, or island pop and different genres of music? Because I actually think this time now during the pandemic is an amazing opportunity for Caribbean genres of music that have not always been in the forefront to step forward. So I could give you um, an example of a deal that recently took place with a good friend of mine, and you all may know him in Trinidad, Marcus Braveboy. He actually landed a deal with the basketball team, the Cleveland Cavaliers. And one of his songs, which is not soca, it's not dancehall, um, it's, a, it's a fusion of, of different sounds. He just got a, a deal with them where his music was used in the background, sort of like a sync opportunity. So the question is, do you all think that this is a time now for collaboration with various genres of music, um, perhaps in Grenada? You know, do you think, Calvin, that Grenadian artists perhaps should be reaching out now to artists across the Caribbean in different genres? Uh, Kai, you know, what do you think? Should there be more of a cross collaboration now to sort of strengthen the Caribbean product? Or do you all think that people should not be worrying about that cross collaboration too much now, but just sort of trying to figure out how to, how to, how to strengthen a virtual product in your own genre? Oh, I see that um, Nevin has just said that Rodney Small and St. Vincent. Oh, that's good. Vincentian fan players are, are doing well also. Rodney Small and St. Vincent is another one who has been doing really well with businesses. This is fantastic. I think, and I think that's the point, y'all, that a lot of us, we don't know enough about what's happening in Caribbean islands just around us. We know what takes place in our island, in our neck of the woods, but the reality is in order for us to have a stronger presence globally, we really do need to collaborate more uh, with each other so that uh, the music can collectively, regardless of the genre, the music can collectively have uh, a stronger presence. Oh, I see that someone has private messaged me and said that um, they believe that uh, 
the collaboration between genres and music is extremely important at this point and that it actually would allow for the strengthening of uh, Caribbean products. And that would actually also allow for more deals to take place. Because we know we've been looking at what's happening um, around, across the world. We all have followed the versus model. I mean, everybody's seen that Beanie Man, Bounty Killer event. Um, recently in Trinidad, we had a similar type of format with Digicel where they had, you know, um, competition. Well, not really a competition, but uh, hosting of an event where soca artists sang against each other. So if we had more of those opportunities where people with various genres of music were sort of presenting themselves now, I do think that this could be an interesting opportunity for the Caribbean to have more of a global presence and Ghana deals with mainstream entities across the world. I'm trying to see any other comments. Uh, if y'all don't have any other questions, if anybody has any questions, we just have about five minutes. You can drop your question in the chat. But I definitely think if y'all can, I'm not sure how the platform works, if you can copy some of the uh, messaging that's been typed here, but we definitely have had some good feedback and names that have been presented to us of pan players doing very well across the Caribbean of events, virtual events across the Caribbean. So I think it would be a useful exercise for you all to actually take note of some of these names and see if you, I don't know whether some of the people that are logged on here uh, belong to any corporate organizations, belong to pan bands and so forth. But certainly you'd want to make note and, um, you know, kind of look to see, okay, what's happening, you know, in this industry and use this as some sort of precedent for how you want to move forward um, in this time. I think that would definitely uh, be a uh, an amazing thing. I see that Calvin is saying cross collaboration is always a very good idea. But my experience tells me that Pan is still very territorial <laughs> in Grenada. Yeah, you would notice, Calvin, that in the episode, Anson, Nyla's manager, Anson Sobral, manager and producer, said that there's a similar feeling here in Trinidad, you know, um, in his, ex in his uh, opinion, that is that the pan players and the pan fraternity can be somewhat territorial. Um, you're saying that because pan is territorial in Grenada, they may not be willing to take the risk and think out of the box, but I fully support collaboration. Yeah, I mean, Calvin, that's how we are going to move forward. We need to have our instruments portrayed globally. So I see nothing wrong with Pan being an instrument for various genres of music. It happens all the time. In fact, as we very well know, uh, some of the Pan schools and so forth are very established in markets outside of the Caribbean. So, you know, is that something that we want to, to, to see continue to happen, that people outside are promoting an instrument that was created right here? I see that Mahalia Thomas is saying, hey, everyone, I'm a panist. Feel free to watch some of my content on social media. Yes, Mahalia, you should probably drop your Instagram, Facebook, or YouTube channel in the chat so that people can easily follow you. I think that would be a very good idea because that's the whole point of sessions like this for us to know what's happening. You never know who's looking on Mahalia. There may be a corporate entity who wants somebody you know, fresh and a different perspective on pan or pan music um, to be their next influencer or to be their next brand partner. So definitely let us see your social media um, so we can follow it. Nevin, you should drop your social media as well. Kelvin, also let us see your social media so that people can follow and, um, you know, get involved with what's happening up the islands because so many of y'all are not from... Uh, Trinidad and Tobago. I see Cat. <laughs> Look at this small word. It looks like Navin knows Mahalia, so that's good. Uh, what are Thomas on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube? So 
in the meantime, while we wa wait on other people to drop their Instagram and Facebook and social media pages, I think I want to leave you all with the whole question of considering whether at this point as well, um, during, oh, like Calvin has said twice, Mass Corporation on Facebook. Yes. I mean, I was very disappointed to not have been able to go to Grenada Carnival earlier this year. That was a major, major disappointment, a major upset. I had not been to Grenada Carnival in, I don't know, a long time, maybe about a decade. So I was looking forward to going there and actually filming a series for the show there specific to Carnival. But, you know, that's how it goes sometimes. We'll see what happens in the future. But we just have, okay, three more minutes. So I want to leave you all... Um, with this thought as we talk about carnival and steel pan and so forth as a business. And I want you also to think about your own organizations at this point, because everyone in this chat is in some way involved in the music industry. You may be an independent artist. You may be a producer. You may be the manager of a steel pan orchestra, or you may be a pan player. What are the weaknesses currently in my organization? Is it that we don't have band members agreements? Is it that the name of our corporation or my stage name is not registered as a trademark? That's the corporation's name as a trademark. You know, is it that you don't have performance agreements that are relative to the virtual space? Because a lot of people um, have been coming to me in my practice and talking about, we have performance agreements, but they don't really apply to online. Well, this is something that you can use your time now to make sure is, is it inserted into these agreements. Or you may need a completely new contract, which speaks to what are the obligations of the person who is paying you for an online event. Is it to make sure that there's proper internet, for example, internet speeds? Is it to make sure that there are proper billboards in advance? The whole world has changed, y'all. So many of your agreements may need updating, you know, to make sure that you can still continue to operate in this new in this new arena. And then the whole question with some of your agreements, your um, your event agreements, the whole question of clauses would speak to what happens in events of a pandemic that never was contemplated before you may need to update your cancellation clauses your termination clauses so i challenge you in this period to use this time effectively while we work towards a 2022 carnival or we work towards the music industry in general next year let us not enter into a situation where we are waking up January 2021 or mid 2021 in the same position that we are now individually as a collective or as a corporation with our music industry uh, steel pan band structures. So I wanna thank everybody for joining this live session. It was really interesting. I thank everybody who made a contribution from all over the Caribbean. I want to thank Music Titi for this really important look at steel pan in the entrepreneurial sphere. And I wish you all a great day and a fantastic rest of your week. Thank you very much. And we will, I will see you again soon.